Let's start by looking at the first tenet of the pre-tribulation rapture theory referred to as the eminence of Christ's return. This is the belief that Jesus Christ could return at any moment for the church. All viewpoints agree that Christians are to be prepared, watching, and waiting for Christ's return, but pre-tribulationalists do not believe that there are any contingencies or further prophetic events that must occur beforehand. Let's examine some of the key scripture that supports this position. Remember, we are only looking at scripture frequently cited by pre-tribulationalists that there is nothing that needs to happen before the rapture can occur. The same scripture may be used for different arguments, but we are only looking here to see if there is anything in any of these scriptures that cite any event that must take place before the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10 says, Wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Christians are called to wait for Christ, but there is no precondition here. So we can check this one off as having no event. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2 For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. This scripture refers to the Lord as coming without any warning like a thief suggesting there are no telltale events to watch for prior to his arrival. So we can check this one as not having an event. Before we move on, we should define the phrase, the day of the Lord. In the Old Testament, the phrase, the day of the Lord, was exclusively used to describe the tribulation period. Other phrases were also used, such as, that day, the day of vengeance, day of wrath, day of punishment, the day of the Lord's anger, the great and terrible day, and the day of distress of Jacob, which is Israel. All of these tie back to Daniel's 70th week, which we will discuss later. Unknown to the Old Testament was the mystery of the church. So in the New Testament, the idea of the day of the Lord was expanded to include the rapture whenever that occurs. 2 Peter 3 verse 10 but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that were done in it will also be exposed. Similarly to the previous scripture, the reference is to Christ coming as a thief without announcement or prerequisite, so we can check this one as no event. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 7 to 8. As you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul speaks to the Corinthians about eagerly waiting for the revelation of Jesus Christ without preconditions or other things that they should be watching for. So we can check this one as no event. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 to 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. Paul reminds the Philippians that we wait for Christ from heaven. Again, there are no prerequisites or events that are listed here that we should be watching for, so we can check this one as no event. Titus chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. Renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live with self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. In this passage, Christians are told that they are to be waiting for the blessed hope of the return of Christ, and there are no events that are listed to precede it. So we can check this one as no event. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. In this scripture, Christians are described as eagerly awaiting Christ's return, and there is no other event they are waiting for prior to that. So we can check this one as no event. Let's also look at what Jesus said in what we refer to as the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, Mark 13, and Luke 21. 
The backstory to this is that Jesus and the disciples were leaving the temple compound, and the disciples were commenting how large and beautiful the stones were that were being used for the construction of the compound buildings. Then Jesus tells them about a coming destruction of the temple and says in verse 6, As for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. In the next verse, verse 7, the disciples asked Jesus three questions about what he had just prophesied. The first was about timing, and the next two were about signs. The questions were these, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? And what will be the sign of the end of the age? The disciples were not yet aware of God's program for a first coming and a second coming. They were looking for the destruction of their Roman overlords and when Jesus was planning to establish his messianic kingdom. This is what many refer to today as the millennial kingdom. And now they were curious about the destruction of the temple and were trying to figure out the timing as it related to the prophecies of the Old Testament prophets which they had studied. Also, they only knew of two ages, the current age and the end of the current age that would usher in the messianic kingdom. They knew nothing about the church age, nor of the events that would eventually be outlined in the church letters or the book of Revelation. Regardless, Jesus answers their questions, but not in the order they presented them. He answers the third question first, the first question second, and the second question third. I will discuss these three questions in more detail when I explain the Olivet Discourse. For now, we'll look at the third question the disciples asked, what will be the sign of the end of the age? That is, their current age prior to ushering in the kingdom. When Jesus answers this question, starting in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, through chapter 25, verse 30, Jesus is using the definition of the age, that is, meaning the end of the age immediately preceding the Messianic kingdom. Even though they aren't expecting any church age, he includes the church age because that is really what is going to happen. This includes things that happened before the time of Jacob's trouble, which is the 70th week of Daniel, as they would have understood it, or the seven-year tribulation period, as we understand it, and things that will happen during that seven-year period. This is because, as far as the disciples were concerned, it was all part of the present age. Jesus starts out by describing two things that will happen that are not signs that the end has started, and then things that will be signs that the end has started. Among these are signs that could be used to calculate his return to establish his earthly kingdom, things that will be seen by everyone. Then in chapter 24, verse 36, he introduces an entirely new topic. He begins to describe his coming as something that cannot be known or calculated. He specifically states that this coming will be impossible to predict. That is what the Jewish idiom, that day and hour no one knows, actually means. It isn't talking about any day, and it's not talking about any hour. It is expressing the idea that something is impossible to know. Jesus continues to illustrate the rapture, but lists no signs or events that will precede it that could warn people that it is coming. Immediately following this, in verse 42, he states this. He says, therefore, stay awake or alert, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Then he gives five parables to illustrate what his followers should be doing to prepare for his coming. The first one is to be watchful. That's the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 13, verses 33 to 37. The second one is to be ready. That's the parable of the master of the house in Matthew 24, 43 to 44. The third is to be diligent. That's the parable of the faithful servant in Matthew 24, verses 45 to 51. The fourth one is to be prepared. That is the parable of the ten virgins found in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. And the fifth one is to be productive. That is the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. In the scripture, believers are described as being watchful, ready, diligent, prepared, and productive because it is impossible for them to know when Christ will come, implying that there is no definite event that needs to happen before the rapture. So we can check this one also as no event. 
In looking at these scriptures, there is no evidence to suggest any event needs to happen before the rapture. However, it can be argued that a list of negatives does not necessarily prove a positive. So, because of the lack of clear scriptural reference that specifically states there is absolutely no event to be required, to be fair, I would say that this tenet holds water well, but might leak about 10%. Let's take a look at the first mid-tribulation position. The seventh trumpet rapture. According to this view, believers will be raptured at the midpoint of the tribulation revealed in Revelation chapter 11 verse 15 says this, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of God has come, the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Their claim is that the last trumpet mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 52, which says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed, is the same trumpet that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. It should be noted that the trumpet Paul mentions to the Corinthians is the same trumpet described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17, where it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. The teaching that a trumpet will sound as the call for the church at the rapture is undisputed between all three viewpoints. The question we are dealing with in this tenet is, are the two trumpets mentioned by Paul and the trumpet in Revelation the same trumpet? To determine that, we need to understand a little bit more about the trumpets and what they were used for. Trumpets were used to get the attention of the people, but never without a purpose. Every time a trumpet was sounded, it was for the purpose of communicating or announcing something. When Paul uses the metaphor of the trumpet, he uses it in a military sense. Not only would this be a familiar idea to the Corinthians and Thessalonians, who were mostly Roman citizens and likely had heard the trumpets sounding for the Roman soldiers, but he uses terms that show he was using a military imagery. In his letter to the Corinthians, one chapter ahead of the trumpet statement for the rapture, he uses a similar context. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 8, he says this, For if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Likewise, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, he says this, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. The result of the trumpet call in both cases was the resurrection of the church saints, both those who had died and those who were alive at the time of the call, what we refer to as the rapture of the church. In the Roman military, a series of trumpet sounds were used for various commands throughout a battle or military operation, leading up to the final trumpet sound, or last trumpet as it was referred to, that signaled the march back home. The cornu was the trumpet that was used for conveying commands on the battlefield, in camps, and during ceremonies. It was large and had a curved horn. With its deep, resonant sound, it would be blown for a longer duration and could be heard over great distances and the noise of the battlefields. It was often used in conjunction with a standard bearer who would use the flag to convey the commands visually. The trumpet that was used by the chief commander to direct major troop movements was the tuba, not the kind of tuba we often think of. This tuba was a straight trumpet with a distinct sound different from the cornu. The final trumpet sound would come after the successful completion of a campaign, or when strategic decisions necessitated a return to home territories. This call marked an end of an operation, directing the army to commence the journey back to their homeland. In the Roman army, the decision to sound the trumpet for any major movement, including the command to march back home, would typically be made by the commanding officer of the unit or the overall commander of the army. For a large army, the Legatus Legionis, who was the legion's chief commanding officer appointed by the Roman Senate or Emperor, 
would have the authority to order the sounding of the trumpet for major maneuvers, including the command to march home. If the army was leaving for camp and heading for home, there would be several in-camp trumpet sounds to give direction for the troops to get ready to leave. Then the commanding officer would come out of his tent and give the order to march to the subcommander. The subcommander would repeat the order to the tubican, who would blow the trumpet to order the movement of the troops. Relating this to Paul's letters, the last trump in 1 Corinthians 15.52 is the last trump to call the church home because it is the end of the campaign of the church. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 to 17, the description provides more detail by saying that the Lord himself, our legatus legionis, or chief commanding officer appointed by the Father, leaves his tent or the Father's house, as referred to in John 14, 2 to 3 and enters into our physical atmosphere, where he then cries out a command to the church. The sub-commander, who is Michael, the only archangel mentioned in the Bible, repeats the command, and then the trumpet of God is sounded. It is important to note that Paul does not mention that we should be listening for trumpets. His emphasis is on the last trump, which is used to call an end to a campaign or battle and bring the troops home. This is because he already, several times, has mentioned that we should always be watching, ready, and prepared for that last trumpet call. Now let's look at the trumpets used in Revelation chapter 8 through 11. There is nothing in the book of Revelation that suggests the seventh trumpet is a different kind of trumpet than the first six trumpets. So, it isn't a last special trumpet different from the others. They are all making the same sound. Each of the first six were followed by judgments of suffering and death, suggesting people were battling for their lives, their very survival. The seventh trumpet is also followed by the devastating seven bull judgments. The earth has become a veritable battlefield, suggesting that the seven trumpets are symbolically more like the Roman cornu used to direct action on the battlefield than the tuba which is used for major troop movements. Revelation 10 verse 7 says this, but in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, suggests that the seventh trumpet sounds over a period of time, at least a period of days. So they are heard over the calamities of the judgments that are ongoing on the earth, and also reminiscent of the cornu, not the tuba. Also, the tuba used by the chief commander was used to signify the end of the battle. After the seventh trumpet sounds, it is very clear that the battle is not over, again suggesting that the seventh trumpet does not match the imagery of Paul's trumpet. The seventh trumpet brings a lot of things with it, but that is not what we're answering here. The question we are answering is if the seventh trumpet in Revelation is the same as the trumpets in Paul's letters. Based on the clear difference between the description of the trumpet mentioned by Paul and the seventh trumpet in Revelation, I don't believe the seventh trumpet tenet can hold water against the scripture at all. It leaks 100%. Let's look at the first tenet of the post-tribulation position, prerequisites to the rapture. Similarly to the mid-tribulation viewpoint, the post-tribulation perspective believes there are prophetic events that must happen before the rapture. Like the mid-tribulation position, it proposes that the signing of the covenant with Israel, the seal judgments, and the first six trumpet judgments must all occur before the rapture. However, it additionally believes that the seventh trumpet and all the seven bull judgments must take place before the rapture, including the abomination of desolation and the death and resurrection of the Antichrist. This viewpoint comes from the idea that the events in Jesus' answer to the three questions posed by the disciples in Matthew chapter 24, 7 precede the rapture. The three questions were, tell us when these things will be, tell us what will be the sign of your coming, and what will be the sign of the end of the age? Remember, Jesus does not answer the questions in the order they were asked. He answers the third question first, what will be the sign of the end of the age? And then the first question second, when will these things be? And then the second question third, what will be the sign of your coming? When Jesus answers what will be the sign of the age, that is Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 to 35, 
The age the disciples had in mind was the end of the age before Jesus sets up his messianic kingdom. They were not thinking in terms of a church age. The disciples, as first century Jews, had expectations of the Messiah that were closely tied to the restoration of Israel and the establishment of a messianic kingdom. The concept of a church age between Jesus' first and second comings, where Gentiles and Jews would be united in one body, that is the church, was a mystery that would be more fully revealed through the apostolic writings that included Peter's vision on the rooftop in Acts chapter 10, and more particularly Paul's epistles. They didn't even understand the concept of Jesus' death and resurrection, even though he told them about it as mentioned in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. It was not until after the resurrection that the disciples' understanding of Jesus' death and resurrection began to fully take shape. And even after the resurrection and meeting with them several times, in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, they still say to him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Even at his ascension into heaven, they still stared upward in wonder after he had disappeared and the angels had to tell them in Acts 1, verse 11, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, this is very significant because the angels didn't tell them Jesus was going to return for them like he told them in Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 to 30a. This is where he says, Immediately after the tribulation in those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Rather, the angels tell the disciples Jesus will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This would be in the clouds and in his glory, but with no mention that the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Neither do the events after his coming align with Matthew chapter 24, verses 30b through 31, where Jesus continues and says, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And they will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. What Jesus describes here is the national repentance of Israel upon seeing Jesus return at the end of the tribulation along with a loud trumpet call by the angels to gather all the scattered of Israel from the four corners of the earth to Jerusalem. Instead, what is being described by the angels to the disciples at Jesus' ascension is what Jesus told them at the Passover meal, which is the Last Supper, in answer to Peter's question in John 13, 36, Lord, where are you going? This is where Jesus answers them in the following chapter, chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. He says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Jesus doesn't list any events that must precede his return for his followers, nor do his angels. He simply tells them that he is coming back to take them to his father's house where he is going. His father's house is in heaven. Now if we go back to Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 to 35, where Jesus starts answering the disciples' three questions, he starts out by describing things that will happen that are not signs of the end of the age, and then things that are signs of the end of the age. Then in verse 36, before he moves to answer the question, what will be the sign of your coming, meaning to establish your kingdom on earth, he circles back to the signs of the end of the age by saying that neither they nor anyone else will know when the final travail just before the birth of the kingdom will happen. He says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows. And we discussed this a little earlier. And then he describes some event that must take place before the final tribulation that was not foretold by the Old Testament prophets, namely an event that happens so quickly 
and without announcement, but no one can predict it. An event where people are going about their normal lives when all of a sudden some of them simply disappear. So when does this event happen? Well, since anyone who had studied the Old Testament prophets, including the disciples, would know that his coming to establish his kingdom can easily be predicted from the signing of the covenant between Israel and the Antichrist, or even when the abomination of desolation happens, it can't be that event. The only other event it can be is the rapture, the same description of which is given by Paul twice. Consequently, when Jesus answers, what will be the sign of the end of the age, he describes lots of signs that will occur before he returns to establish his kingdom. But for the rapture, he is clear that there will be no sign. It will be a surprise. And he lists no events that precede it that would let anyone know it's coming or could time it. Since we are only looking at the post-tribulation claim that there are many events that must take place before the rapture, and since Jesus, the angels, and the apostle Paul clearly imply that there are no events that precede the rapture, this tenet simply does not hold water. Nevertheless, to be fair, because it is virtually opposite of the pre-tribulation viewpoint on eminence, I feel it should be judged similarly. So even in the face of the fact that there are numerous scripture references that suggest and imply that there are no events to precede the rapture, because there is no specific scripture that outright states there are no events, to be fair, I would say this tenet leaks about 90%. In our next lesson, we will look at the next two tenets for each of the three positions. For the pre-tribulation, we will look at the rapture as being a sudden and secretive event, and the claim that the church is exempt from the wrath of God. For the mid-tribulation, we will look at the rapture as being a time of testing for the church and the church's partial exposure to the tribulation. For the post-tribulation, we will look at the rapture as belonging to those who endure to the end of the tribulation and that the rapture coincides with the second coming of Christ.